Welcome to the podcast, Your Future in Sales and Marketing, the podcast that helps you make great career decisions. My name is Mike Dixon, and I'm a professional sales and marketing recruiter. I love what I do, but my biggest frustration is seeing too many people not realizing their career potential. In this podcast, I'll introduce you to my network, an amazing group of business leaders from the biggest tier one organizations through to some super fast growth SMEs. They'll share their career journeys and give unique advice and insights on managing your career and leading a function and a business. Join me, Mike Dixon of AXR Recruitment and Search to help guide your future in sales and marketing. Well, hello and welcome to the podcast, Your Future in Sales and Marketing, with me, Mike Dixon, Director of AXR Recruitment and Search. Now, our purpose at AXR is to help you make great career decisions by giving you access to the insights and expertise of our network of amazing senior leaders. In today's podcast, we have a legend of the FMCG world, Mimo Lebrano, Managing Director of Sanders Fine Foods. Mimo, welcome to the pod. How are you? Thanks, Mike. It's great to be here and uh, I've listened to many podcasts and uh, Hopefully, I can contribute something to this one. Fantastic. Well, look, we've been looking forward to having you on for a while. I think we've planned this um, a couple of months back, but uh, I, I was ill, I remember. So we're uh, we're trying again, but let's go, let's go for it. Let's um, go for and it. we'll get straight into it. So, um, as always, I'm going to ask what your favorite brand is. And you've worked on lots of different brands, and you've obviously built your own brand. Yes. But uh, what's your favorite? Well, actually, it's funny because my I've got a background in music, so I've been performing music since I was 14 or 15 as a bass player and a singer. And I looked at all the brands, and I just love Yamaha. I think Yamaha is an incredible band. My first proper bass was a Yamaha, and I bought a Yamaha product last week, so there you go, uh, a studio mixer. So I just think they just do things very, very well, but they've also got an idea that you need to be affordable as well. So they're a great brand at a fantastic price point. Point, and they just make things so well. It's a classic Japanese sort of precision that you love. So Yamaha is is, is my go to brand. Yeah, excellent. And next up, where are you from? Tell us a little. But we're going to explore your career, right? But let's let's <laughs> go from. Let's let, let's go back to before okay. that. Where, 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 okay. where's, where's Mimo from? Well, when I was a kid, growing up in an Italian family, um, of course, because we were very Italian. So of course, we as a kid, you gravitate towards Australian food because you don't want your own food. So you want you want. And I fell in love with the cocoa pops. You know, it was a great product. And and I remember looking at a cocoa pops packet when I was like six years old. So I want to work for that company. I want to be the. I want to be the cocoa pops brand manager. You know, because I th- I still think it's a fantastic product. Just just don't. Eat too many of them, you know. That's the thing because, I mean, you know, when I eat them, I'll eat like the whole packet. And so, um, and so, I, I, my father had many, many businesses, and he had a business called Sanders Farms in Macquarie Fields, where he used to drag us on the weekends to do basically slave labour. So my my brother and I would get dragged on a Saturday, and he would actually go and work, and I would go and find ways to avoid work. And that's pretty much the same way we've got it now. So that's pretty much the structure of our business at the moment. So fast forward, you know, 40, 50 years, I'm still avoiding work, and Ray's still finding work. So uh, what it means is. Ray's the operations guy and I'm the sales and marketing guy. So we'd get dragged to Macquarie Fields at Sandhurst Farms and and I'd see this pickle factory and I thought, this is an awful factory. And we used to make sauerkraut and one of the things he would do is lock me in the sauerkraut room, you know, and leave me there for half an hour because it was really stinky. Um, <laughs> and then and then I thought, geez, God, this is a terrible business. And then my father was sort of in the process of buying and selling businesses all the time. He's what this nutty professor. Um, and then we realized that probably Sandhurst Farm was actually a really nice business. And so while my father was going through all this you know, success failure in running businesses, I was going through university studying marketing uh, and I thought, well, okay, I like food because we were in a food business as kids. Um, and then I thought, well, I think I want to work for, for back and then it was Eater. I remember Eater was the, one of the biggest food brands. And I remember you know, floating my resume around and the first question they asked is, well, how was your, how were your, your, uh, your, your marks? And my answer was, well, well I passed it. And I, you know, <laughs> what they were saying was, well, hang on, what about HDs and distinctions? I went, no, no, I'm to be chasing girls and playing rock and roll. Oh, you know, so at the end of the day, it was pretty much. Uh, I had to go. I, I didn't really get the gigs that I wanted in the food industry because I thought, well, I know how to. I reckon I know food because I'm comfortable around it. So a gig came up at Cable Makers Australia, which was a, a cable manufacturing company, which was completely different. Um, and I managed to get that job because where Dad had the he had a job doing had a factory doing crumbed and battered seafood. There you go, battering and crumbed seafood. And opposite there was a guy that did electrical parts. And I said, look, I'm going for this Cable Makers job. Could you tell me a little bit about how electrical Electrical works. And he gave me some brochures back then before internet. You didn't find any information, so that must have impressed CMA or Cable Makers Australia because I got the job as a as an assistant product or a marketing cadet, I suppose. 
And uh, and, I, and then I moved under Philips after that because I thought Philips has a consumer division. So here's me always trying to get towards consumer, you know, because I thought Philips, well, and it was in their industrial area, it was electric comp- components. So my last ever job that I've ever had, which was in 91, was assistant product marketing manager, assistant, not product marketing manager, uh, semiconductors, Philips components. The semiconductor is basically, it's the precursor of an integrated circuit, which is what you find in your phones. So the, but, the, per- the perfect entry into into the food industry, working with semi- yeah. semiconductors. Semiconductors <laughs> to to sun dried tomatoes. It's yeah, for me. It's a, it's an easy leap. No, it's a, it's can, a natural progression. Yeah, look, I can see the similarities. You know, and, and one, of the, one of the funny things was when I said to my father, I "said Why are you eating food all the time? Are you, computers are the future." He goes, "You ever try to eat a computer?" I said, "Well, no." He said, "Well, everyone has to eat, you know." And so, food is is something which we which we gravitate towards. So yeah. So my father tapped me on the shoulder in ninety one after I'd been overseas, and he said, uh, "Come and join this business." It was a, pretty much a, a zero business or very small turnover, and he said, "Listen, there's all." olives and we can do eggplant. I said, no one's going to buy eggplant in the jar, Dad. That's ridiculous, you know? And who's going to buy olives? Nobody really likes olives. And he says, well, you'd be surprised how many people actually will eat olives. And I said, listen, okay, I've, I've done, you know, my time at Phillips. And one of my defining moments at Phillips, really, and I'll be honest with you, was when I was in my, I was in sort of, my, I was in tw- my mid to late twenties, I was walking through the office and I walked through the corner office and I saw the national sales manager sitting there in the corner office stressed out like crazy. And he was really old. He was 50 <laughs> and I'm 59. So... I thought, I don't want to be that guy. And I've actually heard of quite a few people in, that own their own businesses say the same thing. I don't want to be that guy. Back then, the business was completely different. You had to come to work every day. And he was what I call probably a middle manager. So I think that was the defining moment. I didn't have a, you know, a family. And I said, well, I said, and I said to my dad, I said, listen, okay, I know you and my brother are actually here doing this crazy olive business. And because we were practicing in the, re- in the warehouse, doing rock and roll on weekends and annoying the hell out of my father, which is probably what I, what I enjoyed doing the most is annoying my father um, with our loud music. Because, uh, And I said to him, I said, what is it, this business? He says, this business could actually be quite something something special. I said, well, okay, l- let's roll the dice, Dad. What, what are you, <laughs> First question, of course, what do you ask your father? What are you going to pay me? You know. And uh, his answer was really interesting. He said, um, I'm not going to pay you anything, really. I said, well, mate, I'm pulling down some huge dollars at, at Phillips, which I wasn't. Um, and he said, listen, but if you do make something, we'll share in the profits. I said, okay, so you want a, what I call an equity partner. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll I'll play your game, Dad. I'll play you. You know, I'm living at home. We don't pay board or rent because we're Italians, you know. Uh, and so uh, I gave it one year. And, and after one year, I realized, hang on, there's something here. He's, the old man's right. He might be crazy, but he's actually got something here, you know. And, and we actually started to achieve something. So my first calls literally were, uh, and I would literally get dressed in a shorts and T-shirt and do the deliveries in the morning and then get changed in the Franklin's car park at Chalora, putting on a suit and tie and walking to the buyer at 3 o'clock going, hello, I'm from Sandhurst. And the guys would be looking at my van going, what's in the back of your van, mate? I said, don't worry, it's the deliveries for tomorrow, you know? So Brilliant. that was that was my my early days, yeah. And so You mentioned Ray a couple of times there yeah. as well as your dad. So, yeah. so Ray was in the business already with, yeah, your, with, 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 your, yeah. with your dad. Yeah. Qualified lawyer. Yeah, yeah, qualified lawyer, interesting. Yeah. And, yeah. and did you kind of have this separation of roles immediately oh, yeah. well, and thought, right, Ray, you're doing this bit, family business, I'm going to do this yeah. bit. Family Business 101, you need to have defined roles. So, uh, you know, in corporate, you call it chain of command or chain of responsibility. There's a line that goes down the middle of the organization. One brother becomes uh, sales, marketing, buying, international buying. The other brother becomes operations, warehouse, factory, and finance is the football that's kicked around between the two of them, right? Mm-hmm. And because no one wants to do finance because it's pretty boring, you know? So the finance side is what is what is the, is the, the unloved child, you know? Uh, and it's always the last area to get the attention of the organization as well. But it's probably the most important part because if you can't can't make the finance team work, then, you know, you don't know if you're making money sort of thing, you know. So, uh, yeah, it was interesting. So that's, we pretty much decided that was the way it's going to be because when dad approached me, he says, look, I can make the product, I can deliver it, but I just need someone who can sell it. And I think I told you before that, you know, when you graduate from marketing or marketing degree at University of Technology Sydney, the first thing they teach you is you don't have to sell. I wish they would teach you that you do have to sell because without selling, I couldn't have, I couldn't have achieved anything. So I actually had to learn how to sell mine, which was well, interesting. And yeah, some knowledge of I guess the food world, FMCG, as you said, you know, from mainly having a look at these factories and saying, and saying to your dad, I don't know what's going on here, but mm. obviously you, you're now in the business, yeah. you're rocking up to customers, mm. selling products. How mm. did you learn? Did you feel out like your depth? How did you kind of well, get up to the speed? The learning was interesting because I've thought about this because I had a series of mentors. Um, I didn't realize that at, back when I was in my late 20s that old people weren't listened to. I thought everyone has to listen to old people because, you know, respect for your elders. So I, I latched onto quite a few older older people. One of my best, well, obviously my best mentor ever is my father. 
he's 92 and still, you know, I just saw him at lunchtime today. He's going, going well. Um, and one of these guys was a gentleman who was the head of Cerebos. Uh, and he managed to took, take, took a, as a Scottish guy, he's from Glasgow. Um, and he's no longer with us, unfortunately. He was head of Cerebos Australia and he pioneered their food service division and he became a, a mentor to me. And I had an old guy, an older guy who was doing selling for a lot of the uh, FMCG companies in the seventies and eighties. So I would ver- literally go and listen to the older guys and they would teach me the game. Uh, and I, I, you know, if any young people want to ask me for advice, I, 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 you don't charge for advice. You just give it and, and it'll come back to you in some other way. So I think that's a really good piece of advice. Well, you know, this podcast has got pretty good coverage in the market. You might get a couple of calls well, on the back I, of on back of that. I don't mind. I, I, answer, I answer LinkedIn messages, provided they're not trying to flog me something I don't need. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I answer most LinkedIn messages with you know either thank you or whatever it is. But if it's something I don't need to buy, I'm not going to buy it. You know. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, I think yeah. we're all a bit like that. Exactly. Did you have a plan back in the day in terms of actually we're going to grow this business? These are the I, phases we're going to take it through, or was it more just kind of my my only plan or the plan for the business was to be the market leader in in olive. And I thought, well, everyone knows everything about wine. Is there an olive expert in Australia? Um, no, no one knows anything about olives. I think olive oil was just starting then. So I thought, I want to be the guy, one of the guys that knows everything about table olives because I saw what happened with wine. I saw there's a lot of wine gurus out there. And I thought, well, I want to be the table olive guy. So I want to learn about it. And that was 33 years ago. And I can tell you now, I still don't know everything about olives. Mm. So it's something that fascinates me. Getting product specific for me is a really big thing for me to understand product. That's why I visit probably more factories than any anybody else I know. I just come back from Bangkok where I visited uh, Thailand where I visited corn factories and tuna factories and Thai sweet chili sauce factories, which I found fascinating. Um, and and I live you, in those places. And is that the kind of been the plan from the start, right? Let's look at product categories. Yes. Yeah, where category. we yeah. can yeah. grab a foothold yep. and, and, be- yep. and become experts. Yes, understand. I, I, I call it the big fish in the small pond. Um, you know, you talk about smoked salmon, I talk about capers, right? As soon as you say smoked salmon, I'm thinking capers, right? And I'm thinking, well, you need to buy your capers. And I'm sure you forgot to buy capers yesterday when you bought your smoked salmon. So you need to remember to bring them or, you know, I need to make them more available to you. That's my job. Uh, our job is to grow the caper market because we pretty much control a lot of it. Um, sun-dried tomatoes, olives. Um, in food service, we've got a, a sizable business as well. That's the other thing that people probably don't realize that we are 65% food service, 35% retail or 30% retail, 5% export. So uh, retail is a smaller part of the business. Yeah. And give the listeners just a, a sense of the scale of Sanders today, Mimo. Uh, well, we're in, we're in, uh, we're in every state. We're in, uh, Woolies, Coles and Costco and Aldi. Uh, we export to about, uh, 15 countries across Asia. Um, and yeah, we're, we're a sizable business. Yeah. We're quite a, quite a sizable business that's reached some, some sort of scale. And it's um, more, more than just yourself, your dad and Rena. Well, yeah, we've got 80 staff members, 80 staff members across the whole country. And we manufacture in Miranda, which is still, we're still very proud to manufacture product in Australia. So we are, I think, the only company that repacks, uh, jalapenos, um, and, and sort of sun-dried tomatoes in sort of scale. I mean, there's a few others that do sun-dried tomatoes, but we're probably the largest in that sort of repack area. We've we've stayed with manufacturing in Australia and charcoal eggplant is 100% pesto, is 100% Australian as well. So things like pesto are not in retail yet, but I want to find a way to get pesto into retail because we've got a fantastic pesto, which we sell in food service and everybody loves it. And you've probably tried it on your sole origin pesto salad and things like that because it appears everywhere and uh, we, everybody loves it. It's 100% Australian. It's the family recipe. So yeah, it's, it's a great guarantee I have. Yeah, well, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a natural pesto. It's actually done the way that we do it at home. And that's the beautiful thing about when you own a family business that's Italian, you get to just select your ingredients, you know. Uh, you don't have to worry about the accountants or the food technology to get us, and I want that in the product. Yeah. And uh, and you, you, do, you generally work it all out, which is good. So, yeah. yeah. And there's that kind of mission and purpose of um, Big Fish Small pond and I guess the underlining strategy of Santa. So that changed. Is that Not still really. today I, I the think, same? I think we 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 will look at categories where we can um, where we can add some value in food service. We play in you know olive oil and and vinegars and and you know we we play a bit of vinegars in retail, but we can we can dominate canned foods in food service. We'll never dominate canned foods in retail, to, to my knowledge, anyway, because it's a very commoditized product and it's very heavily geared around private label. So I think to pick a fight with you know the 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 big guys in FMC. G and like you, you, you guys that are playing in, in canned veg, um, that's a big one. I think sauces is probably something we could probably launch into because I think sauce is niche enough. Um, and sauces is changing. We do a lot of Thai sweet chili sauce in food service. Um, so there's probably something in that in terms of looking at categories where we can make a difference. Speaking of sauces, probably uh, truffle sauce is where we've just entered into. So a truffle pasta sauce is a beautiful product. And that's something which we've just launched under the Jimmy Tartuffi brand, which is sensational. So literally a truffle parmesan sauce. And uh, this is this 
will blow your mind. Boil up your pasta. You use the Jimmy Tartuffi pasta sauce. You put in half the jar, stir it through your cooked pasta. Don't cook it, whatever you do, like the pesto, and just serve. And then you've got something which you've made for $5, which you've paid $35 in downstairs in Barangaroo. So there you go. So wow. I've just saved you 30 bucks. Go and buy a nice bottle of wine. <laughs> so, so that's, that's, that's Jimmy Tartuffi in a nutshell for you. It's a beautiful product. And we're doing well with their truffle paste in food service because it's a sensational product. But once again, we sell it in food service to add value to the dishes that our food service partners are trying to, to make money out of because making money in food service is incredibly difficult, right? It's just a, a real challenge. So, yeah, but that's that's the food service side. But anyway. Well, we're yeah. recording this mid-afternoon on a Thursday. Mm. Um I've had my lunch not that long ago, but you're making me really hungry. Well, <laughs> on your way home, go to Woolies, pick up Jimmy Tartuffi Parmesan truffle. And uh, I've tried it on a few people that don't, don't eat truffle, that never tried truffle in their life and uh, very positive results. So I'll do it. I love yeah, truffle. It's, that's it's beautiful. It's, 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 it's uh, truffles. The one of these, we talk about these flavors like chipotle, truffle, you know, wasabi, black garlic, you know, that's the beautiful thing about food service. You can see all these things firsthand, you know, yeah. and some of them will fail. There's no doubt about it. And a yeah, truffle might fail, but you know, I think it's got some pretty good legs behind yeah. it but anyway yeah. i get the sense that you are quite opportunistic you're happy, oh, yeah. you're happy to yeah. have a go at things yeah yeah and you know being the owner of a business we try stuff and uh, my biggest challenge is getting my staff to make mistakes you know I, could you make mistakes please because i'm sick and tired of making them and when you do make one i'll take the blame for it don't worry but i think they they really worried they're really concerned they don't want to make too many mistakes and if, if they come from corporate i think because they have to go through lots of layers of decision um literally people walk into my office every day and go what do you think of this i said yeah okay if you reckon why not? No problem. It's going to cost me a lot of money. Well, well, Mike, have you thought about this? Well, okay, try it. Um, and sometimes they get it wrong and I say, well, okay, I would have done the same thing, but yeah, okay. Nothing ventured, nothing going. I've launched some some really dog products in, in retail and food service that I fell in love with. That was the problem. So uh, yeah. But unless I launched them, I, I wouldn't we wouldn't have known what they were what they were going to be capable of. So yeah. 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 You've got to launch the, you know, it's like everything, you've got to launch it to know if it's going to work. So yeah. And yeah. with that opportunistic mindset. I, I, does anything pass you by? Do you think, look back and go, oh, I wish I did launch that. I, mean, day, I, I, I missed that opportunity. Every day, every day I had an example in our own category where I saw a product which was trending in, in independent retail and I thought I thought to myself for a few years, so we could put that in a jar and someone beat us to it. So, yeah, we, you know, I, we, I, I highlighted to the team today. I said, we've missed this one because I, I thought about this, but it was probably one of my 400 ideas I had at the time and probably wasn't, uh, you know, we didn't prioritise it. So, and that's why I employ professional people. One of the best, best quotes I had because I'm hiring some staff at the moment, someone said about me, you've got to manage him up. I said, that's great. I love managing up. So in other words, I like learning from my staff, you know, yeah. uh, and that's one of the best things about working with professional people because you learn so much from people. Yeah. It's incredible. So getting really good staff that challenge you every day. And sometimes I don't like the answers, Mike, but you know, yeah. it's, it's no different to being married. You know, your wife will tell you stuff that you need to know and, and it's, it's for the, it's for your own benefit, not for the, you know, anything else. So yeah, it's actually quite good. And I don't, I mean, you know, we're big and big and ugly enough to look after ourselves too. Yeah. Right? So yeah, it does. Good. Yeah. Have you ever been tempted to do something else? Yeah, I always want to be a rock star, and my kids tell me that I'm 59, I'll never make it, but I reckon I'll make it. Um, no, look, I think, I think I've always, I mean, because being a musician, you're always, you know, always looking for the gig. I do something else. Yeah, I think I could probably do, um, something else in, but I think it always go back to food. I just, I just, I just like food, and I think food, I mean, my number plate is LV food, love food. Um, and so I can't do anything outside of food, but you know what I can't do is I can't sell something I don't like. I can't sell a food I'm not in love with, you know? Um, and so that's probably where the foods that have failed, the ones that I don't really have the, 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 you know, we've got a saying, this will change your life, you know? So if it, and it's got to change your life. If I give you a truffle, which will change your life, it's got to change your life. Otherwise you're going to say, well, mate, well, everything changes your life now, you know? Um, so yeah, there's stuff there that I reckon I could get my teeth into in other categories. For example, if you go to New Zealand, there's a, there's a, as a chocolate milk, I forget what it's called, Lewis Road Dairy. I don't know if you've ever tried it. That yeah. will change your life. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's uh, actually, it's actually almost like a cult over there. Oh, it's, yeah. it's, it is incredible, you know, that would change your life. So I could sell that, you yeah, know. Yeah. I could, I'd love to sell. I'd move to New Zealand and just sell that, you know. <laughs> it's just a trend that. <laughs> yeah, just just eat this one, you know. So yeah, I yeah. think I think I could try something, but I think within within FMCG, could I sell alcohol? Probably. I drink enough of it. Um, but once again, I think it's probably an area which you, you, it, it's like everything else. It, it's like the music industry. Looks looks easy from the outside. Mate, get on stage and do it and, and you'll find out how hard it is, you know. Yeah. So yeah. And what about 
your role now, Ray's role. Yeah, um, okay. Have they developed over the years? Are you still doing the same things, just in a bigger way? No, I think we've. Well, I've got to realise that I've got better people running the business than me. Um, so yeah, we toy around the idea of an MD, a CEO, or whatever you want to call him. You know, uh, I'm, be- I'm so bad with titles. I advertise for a marketing person. I call him a CMO. I didn't realise. I didn't even re- realise what a tier one was until yesterday. So there you go. Um, I'm just not up with the jargon. I'm probably too old. And, <laughs> you did good recruiter. I'm, I'm the yeah. No, I'm the I'm. I'm <laughs> I'm counter FMCG in a lot of ways. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, as the sort of the owners of the business, one of the best quotes I've ever heard, Mike, is, you know, just because you own the plane doesn't mean you can be the pilot. Um, someone can actually drive the plane better than you can. And I reckon there's there's a lot of examples of that. So I think Ray and I have decided that we're going to look at what we can do to support the people that are working for us. Um, one of the most liberating things you do is you talk to your staff and realise if they're going to be in or out. Um, and if they don't have the care factor, then it's it's in their interest more than yours to, to move them on. And I've done that with a couple of staff members and seen that they've been there for a long time. And I said, listen, you don't really have the passion or, you know, you probably had it and you probably lost it. Um, let's part ways. And and the ones you replace them with generally will give you the, the better result. Um, you know, it's because as a family business, we've got people that have been there for 20 years and they are incredible 20 years, but there's equally incredible ones that have been there for, for, for um, 12 months, Mike, you know. And that's, I think you need the balance of the 12, the 12 months with the 20 years. Yeah. And that's the one that's going to give us the growth because I've seen where inexperience, and it costs us, inexperience always costs us. And it's almost like you walk past and you go, I know that's wrong. Do I tell them? Otherwise, I'm micromanaging. I don't want to micromanage. But I think Ray and I are realizing that the more we try and micromanage, the worse it's going to be for us because I'll end up owning the job. So Ray and I are, are very much on the same level where we say um, we're going to try and step back and let our managers do what they're supposed to do. Uh, and the best example is our interstate offices. So we've got th- three interstate set offices that are incredibly well run by the managers there. And no, we don't know what time they go home. And no, we know we don't know what samples they give out. And no, we don't know what they what they take. And um, but we just got to have a lot of trust in them. And that's and that goes that goes contrary to the Italian Italian fruit shop market ethic, you know? Mm. So I'll talk about the overgrown fruit market because you know people have walked in and goes, this is an overgrown fruit market. And you know what? It is an overgrown fruit market in a lot of ways. You yeah. you walk into Sanders and go, this looks like an overgrown fruit market. And then and it is a lot of ways. But in other ways it feels almost corporate, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and is your dad still in, he's involved? He's like ninety two. You, you said you saw him today for lunch. It's funny you should say yeah. that. Absolute today, they're having a few issues with our pesto production. Yeah, and my dad's ninety two. My mum came to work today, and she's eighty five. <laughs> and we're talking about the issues we're having pesto, and she's going, Vince, ninety two. Get out on the pesto lines. Find out what's going on. You know, go down there, and he's going. I haven't touched the pet pet line in 20 years. She goes, you need to go out there and have a look, you know, because my nephew's there and he's on the line. He's living it every day. And I'm sort of, I'm thinking to myself, what could you possibly, and I thought he might just have some gem that he hasn't thought of. And that's what a 92 year old does. Um, then again, he'd probably turn around and say, well, mate, I don't know anything about it. You better go and talk to a, you know, an an emulsification expert, because that's what it is, an emulsification issue, you know, but that's the beautiful thing is when the problems are there, the whole, and that's the good thing. The whole company is now vested in trying to get the pesto better, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so, and it's just to, to do with the, the moisture level of the raw material is too high. <laughs> so we're getting uh, basil from far north Queensland. They've had some heavy rains and breeding new basil strains. So the, the cell content of the basil is quite is quite high in water. Right. I'm sure, you, I'm sure your dad knew that. Well, <laughs> he'd work it out. But it's funny, you just hear him in your background going, oh, yeah, I can hear what dad's saying now, you know, he's saying yeah. this and that. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that old influence is good. So the three generations we've got, our dad, myself, and my nephew, Daniel, that we've got the three of us in there. And I think we're, you know, I think it's it's really, really fun to go to work, you know, yeah. and that, that's really the, the test, you know. My brother's a little less stressed out these days, which is good because he's the sort of guy that worries. Good. Yeah. Now, I, I get a sense from the, the conversation memo that you've talked about corporate a couple of times, but yeah. there's still this family business. You kind of got this juxtaposition yeah, of yeah. where do you sit and can, or can you be both? Yeah. Do, I, do you think there's a balance there yeah, going forward? Yeah, I, I think you just got that agility. We can't lose agility. We can't be we can't be non-agile. We can't ignore a customer request, you know? I just look at companies and how they look, look treat customers and how could you treat your customers so bad? And then I say to people, if I treat my, if my business is running like yours, I would, I would sell it. Um, so the customer-centric part of it has 
has to be, customers have to be first and foremost. But it's interesting because if we look at our priorities, the, our customers are actually third priority um, in terms of the, the real, the, the big picture because, and it's not because they're not important, it's because we, we value our staff more than anything. You know, Branson will tell you that look after your staff, they look after your customers. Suppliers are incredibly important. So yeah, I think that agility to look after the three major groups is something that we will will never lose. Um, and yes, I've got to go and visit all the suppliers next week at Anuga because that's what I'll do because our suppliers are critical. And I want to be the, the the customer of choice for our suppliers, which means I've got to pay them on time and I've got to look after them. I've got to try and solve their problems when they become our problems, which a lot of companies probably don't do that, you know. So I think that whole personal touch and, you know, the European model, the Europeans tend to play the, the personality rather than the company. Uh, and that's the good thing about the European business model is they like to deal with people and they and it's very hard to gain to their trust to gain to their trust. So once you do, um, it's something that you can pretty much bank on. Um, mm-hmm. That that's so. One thing I would not change is that agility. One thing I would like to do is have a bit more professionalism about the way the way I operate and the way the way we operate as well and how we we sort of run our business professionally. You know, and I guess that's um, the journey you're, you're on. As you alluded to earlier on, as you and Ray seek to change your roles a little bit and, yeah, and, yeah. and identify how yeah. to empower the people working for Correct, you yeah, to, to yeah. take more decisions. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, and potentially, you know, change your roles in the business or working more yeah. in, a, in, a, in a different yeah. way. One, one yeah. of the, my, my staff has said to me, you know, the, the most exciting thing about Sandoz is you, you, the train driver is in front of you. So yeah. you can actually have a chat with the train driver. Uh, well, can you do that with a lot of companies? You probably can't, you know? Yeah. So the train driver is right there. And the other thing is we can bring a product to market. Uh, I had one with, with with Aldi, this was two years ago when the supply chain was completely disrupted and we had to bring a product to market in five days and we did it. Five days to bring a product to market. It was incredible. We had the labels, we had the raw material, we had the jars and we said, we can do you 25 pallets in one day, which was bizarre. And we actually, we did them 25 pallets in one day, which was incredible. Uh, and I don't know in any other organization. And that was one of the most liberating things that you could do is give a customer a solution within five days, you know? Ridiculous. Um, yeah. Turn a product in five days. It's Ridiculous. just, yeah. I probably have probably done it in three if I would have pushed, yeah. you know? Yeah. But the, the funny thing was in the production line, they said, we can only do 22 a day. I said, let's set the goal for 25 and, and let's have a goal and celebrate the goal. So we bought them all a, you know, some ni- a nice gift and things like that. So they did their 25, which was really, great, which is really, brilliant, really nice. Now, your dad's obviously a, a still great mentor to yeah, you. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. You know, from a business point of view, where else do you go in a family business for support, for for advice? In, interesting. Uh, I know we have a lot of networks. I mean, AFGC is a good one for, for myself because AFGC is a, a really nice, and they've got a really nice SME program. I don't know if you know about that. That's a really nice little resource great. where the small and, man, small and medium enterprises get together and we get to access to to senior uh, people from, from you know, not only Woolworths and Coles, but also some great analysts and great, great consultants as well. Uh, the other one we use, Ray and I both use uh, pretty much extensively is the FBA Forum Group, Family Business Australia. And FBA, literally, I mean, I remember one great FBA conference where I, I found uh, Bundaberg Soft Drinks, uh, John McLean. He was speaking and uh, I, it was in Melbourne. I remember it clearly. And I walked up, John, I love your style. Um, listen, I, if I'm in Bundaberg anytime, can I give you a call? He said, mate, no worries. Um, he gave me half a day, half a day with his, with his key export people. And uh, I remember him telling me about his export plans and what a fantastic story Bundaberg Soft Drinks is, uh, an iconic brand in soft drinks, and uh, and he would give me a day if I asked for it. And so John McLean was very, very generous with his time, but I would never have seen John McLean or known him if I hadn't have seen him at a family business conference. But the the, the, the forum groups are, are incredible because you're with 10 people every month and they keep you accountable. So whatever you say in a family business forum group is confidential uh, and it's issues related to your family business. So you probably have got a problem with your brother, your cousin, your uncle, your mother, uh, which are all in extreme strictly linked in a family business. Um, I, I describe family businesses sometimes like the have a go show. Um, you know, I remember showing my father a great family business and he said, we should be more like that. I said, yeah, but we don't run a dictatorship, dad. You know, um, this is not one, one ship, one captain. This is a uh, four people that are, uh, are supposed to have a go, have to have a say. And that's why, that's the way we, we, we function. So, um, the good thing about FBA is they get you to understand your, your brother or your partner and they, they get you to work on yourself, uh, as opposed to that conflict. And I can honestly say with that FBA, we probably wouldn't be where we are. And a lot of FBA members that have used the forum group will tell you exactly the same thing. It's an incredible resource. You have to be a family business. Ideally, you'd be, you know, more than say 10 employees as a family business. And there's, there's employees, well, there's, in my group, I've got the Kennards. The Kennards have got, you know, a huge business. Kennards are higher, which is an incredible business and another huge. I've got Game Farm as well, which are a, 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 a game business. They do a poultry and game. It's an incredible business as well. So yeah. yeah what, so what, a fant- what a fantastic association. FBA. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. yeah. And and you know what it is? It's a board. Someone described it as a board of directors that you meet that has no vested interest in trying to um, charge you any money. Yeah. yeah. So so, so um, it's actually a very genuine. It's a genuine board. It's, it's, a, it's yeah. an executive consulting yeah. board. The good thing about it is you'll invariably find in ten people. There's one guy who's really strong in finance. I'm the guy in our FBA group. I'm the guy that that uh, hands out beers and tells jokes. So I'm the joke teller uh, because I'm always one with a joke. Uh, but there's also guys that are strong. So if I've got a finance issue, or if I've got a, uh, a HR issue, there's some person in there that actually is really really well 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 healed in finance or HR or in in operations. You know, uh, and so you get his. An operations dilemma for you, or you know, I've got a he's got a he's a situation with a staff member, and they go, Oh, yeah, oh, we've had about three years ago, you know. Uh, and they really keep you they keep you so well informed, it's incredible. FBA is a, a great, but like every other club, Mike, it's just only as good as the membership, you know. Yeah, and what you put into it is, it's, is it's what you put, it's what you yep. contribute. So don't go there unprepared, go there mm. with your homework done, find out what's what's working in your life, your personal life, your family life, your family business life, and your business. There's three areas there's your business, your, your family business, and your personal life as well. Mm. So mm. you've got to then also share personal objectives, which is pretty, you know, it can be a bit bit confronting as well. But that's that's part of that to me, that's part of the holistic training of trying to be a, a better person or a better business person. Because you know, that's the other thing, you know, having supporting family is is just in, it's just is so important. So we are so blessed that we've got uh, wives and 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 uh, family that really stand by us. So Wonderful. that's one thing. One thing we don't talk about enough. And you know, even when I put a post on LinkedIn or Facebook, I go, geez, I didn't mention, you know, my fantastic wife Grace, who's just been so much support for me. So yeah. Awesome. So that's it. Yeah, well, that's, that's the thing you got to you got to be wary of. So yeah, good. Now we're recording this in September twenty three. So the question I'm going to ask is contextual. If you're yes. listening to this in the year twenty four, twenty five, sorry, but um, we're living in really interesting times. Yes, in terms yes, of the, the the market, and it, it feels like we've been living in interesting times since COVID, really. Yeah, but yeah, um, yeah, yeah. but what what do you think? The, the kind of short to medium term looks like from a market point of view. I think we haven't changed. I think pre-COVID we haven't changed much. I think we, our food tastes have actually um, probably refined because we've actually realised that we want quality. What's good about COVID is we've realised that food's a value. We need to pay for it. So this whole discount mentality is is is, is is gone. It hasn't gone. It's been reduced, I suppose. So the whole idea of cheap food for me, which was always something that I couldn't understand, why would you want cheap food? And if you want a proof of that, I mean, when I first started, there was all these all-you-can-eat restaurants, and now uh, you couldn't you couldn't give away an all-you-can-eat restaurant. Who wants an all-you-can-eat restaurant? Because it's it's a, it's not a great concept, you know. Uh, the concept of quality over quality over quantity is something which which we know. I think once you've used to a certain taste profile, um, I always tell my famous maple syrup story, where I you know as a kid and growing up we only had imitation maple syrup and then one time someone showed me what real maple syrup tasted like I went that's yuck that's terrible and they go you buffoon that's actually real maple syrup and then I realized it had nuances and flavors and notes you know and I went okay now I'll probably I now I go and search for a $50 bottle of maple syrup Mike that's what I do you know because yeah. that's my obsession so once you've had a really good quality product it's very hard to move down from that and which is which is interesting because if we want to tell the story on say truffles we've got to launch a very genuine truffle product out there because we can't can't really do imitation, and it happens in, in in a lot of areas. In and in truffle as well, there's truffle flavored oils, which we do sell in food service for some of the budget customers. Um, they're, they're okay, but they're not the, the real the real deal. So I think as a society, we've actually learned what quality is, and we're quite prepared to pay a little bit more for some good quality. Do you think that will stand up in the cost of living crisis? I think people in food um, know what they want, and if you look at the restaurant trade, the ones that are doing it well are the ones that provide exceptional value for money. Um, um, and regardless of the price, the, the, the problems I have with restaurants is I paid a lot of money, but the service was atrocious, right? Um, and I have these experiences or I, if I paid a little bit and I got really good quality, then I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy. But, and I, I, I pretty much put it down to food service. It's, it's like anything you sell. If the basic product is good, if the repertoire is good, the food is exceptional quality, then you go, okay, the, it's the number one rule of Italian restaurant, great quality, it's terrible service, you know? Um, and that's why you forgive them. But if it's the service is bad and the food is average, um, you can pretty much say, well, that's, that's not going to work. And, and that's, that's the problem with, with that model. So I think people are very savvy, very intelligent when it comes to to repertoire, and of course, the the internet web thingy is, is is a you know in the in the palm of our hand with TripAdvisor or you know all those sort of reviews. And the other thing with Tripadvisor, you got to understand that one in ten per- persons an absolute moron. So you're going to get <laughs> you're going to get that that one that ten percent moron factor. So you get yeah. that out of the way. Yeah. So you know nine out of ten is good enough for TripAdvisor. Thank you yeah. very much. You know, good. Um, so yeah, it's a, I think that's what people are really looking for. People are incredibly educated on food. Good. I'm know? I'm pleased to hear that. It's a, co- yeah. a confident future. I like to talk the market 
up and positively. Mm. Um, and uh, my, my view, to be honest, is that, uh, yeah, it's a bit lumpy right now, but as a recruiter, our demand for talent is the same now as it was six months ago, as it was 12 months well, ago. So it's, because uh, you, yeah. you, know, you pay for quality in every aspect. You pay yeah. for quality in staff. And yeah. that's another revelation that we've had as a family business that you can't pay, pay peanuts and get monkeys. You know? yeah. um, you've know, you got to pay market wage. And, and yeah. this is a bit of a, a battle between myself and my brother because he, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't really, he, although he wants to know what people are paid these days, yeah. but you've got to give a fair. And the other thing is, it's not all about the money. So when you work for Santos, if you're just purely made of, made of money, you're probably better off going somewhere else because it's, yeah. it's, it gives you freedom, autonomy. It gives you lifestyle. Uh, and you know what? We're going to have a bit of fun as well. I mean, my parents are actually saying, Oh, you know, you're laughing around at work. What's going on? You're not really working. Ray and I go, well, let's just have a joke. It's life's not that serious, Mike. You've got to have a good time yeah. at work. If you don't, you yeah. know, and that's, I said to my stuff, if you don't enjoy coming to work, go and do something else, please, you know? Love it. Because you're not, you're, you're not here. I mean, you spend more time at work and just to try and enjoy yourself, really. And it leads me to my next question, which mm. is, what's the future for the business? Now, you mentioned earlier your nephew's there. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's a third, becoming a third generation third business. Generation, yeah. Is it a business yeah. that just well, therefore continues well, in that vein or does someone come along one day and offer you a big check and well, you kind of go? the funny thing is this question's asked all the time and the, the person asking that question the most is our staff. When are you going to sell? Right, it's not if you're going to sell. What's sort of why would we want to sell? Once again, FBA. Go back to FBA. FBA is tied to a, comp, a, a mob called FBN, which is in Geneva. Uh, and FBN Food, per, Food Business Network has uh, companies like Faber Castell, which make pencils, uh, and they're like seven or eight generations. So FBA's charter, I suppose, or the new charter should be: How do we stop businesses from selling on second and third generation? Um, and so our answer to that is: Well, my nephew is 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 26. He's joined the business. He seems to think well, he's he's got a lot of of, a lot of potential. He seems to think there's a lot of fuel in the tank, you know. He seems to think that there's there's a lot we can do. Uh, I have lunch with him virtually every day, which is great. And I'm and I'm trying to ask him a lot of questions, right? Rather than telling him, I'm trying to ask Daniel, Daniel, what do we need to do? Where do we need to be? Uh, I'm conscious of the fact that I probably know far too much about this business and and I need to start listening more than talking. Um, but I'm I'm asking him, and I even asked my because I'm hiring a marketing position. I you know I actually had to really swallow my pride and ask my two daughters, what do I I look for in a marketing person and what are we doing wrong in marketing girls you know well did not didn't I get it didn't I get a tirade of answers you know there's a 23 year old 26 year old you know absolutely brilliant kids very smart much smarter than their father um you know telling me exactly what's wrong with their marketing and you know what I thought Jesus I, I hate it when you're right it's just so right you know yeah uh, there's something about young people that just it just it's just really honest and you know and uh, but it's it's brilliant it's it's liberating so the future is that if I can if we can get the young people our niece or our the, the, the four grandchildren, and that's my parents' dream is to see the grandchildren, you know, really living the business. And I think they're realistic to know that probably it might be out of the four grandchildren might be two. Um, but the way it's looking is that one of my daughters will probably uh, is probably well well groomed to join in in maybe five or six years. But if she doesn't, then that's fine. Yeah. And even if Daniel doesn't want to stick around, if he decides that he wants to move along, then that might be something as well, Mike. But yeah, yeah. I think we can't really um, put it on the market and try and sell it because there's just so much more work to do. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, what do they say? The purpose of the business is to give you a life, not to take one away. Uh, and very, that's something that I, I think I think it's taken us a long time to learn that, but it's got to give you a life. It's got to give you something that you can you can you can stay away for for two months or, or two weeks if you want, if you show desire. So yeah. a few questions to finish with, three questions to finish with. First mm-hmm. of all, there'll be plenty of listeners who are loving your energy, Mimo, love Thank the you. passion you got for the business and <laughs> thinking you. Gosh, I wonder if I could work at a Sanders or a family business. I'm yeah. sitting in corporate right now in yeah, a, yeah. a big okay. FMCG and I'm wondering what, what does it take to work in that type of environment? Yeah. And, and in, with your advice, what does it take? What, you know, okay. how, how can you think make of, Okay, I'm going to give you a good analogy. Think of a wheelbarrow, right? A wheelbarrow is, is a concept we use in small business. It's called the wheelbarrow, right? I use it every day. A wheelbarrow, it's not going to move unless you push it, right? So in the corporate, you've got other people that, that drag you along and tag you along, right? Uh, in, in small business, you've got the wheelbarrow. It won't move unless you, it won't push unless you move it. So you join, and I'll be honest with you, what in 33, 35 years of operating in Sanders, our biggest problems have been operational. Operations, we can't get it, we can't deliver 
deliver it. Um, you know, we just we make promises we can't deliver because we've run out of stock, you know. Why run out because no one ordered it, someone forgot to order or some the system didn't work, you know. Um, and so what happens is you get them from corporate and they think there's someone else driving NPD or, or someone's driving logistics or there's a demand planner. I don't even know what a demand planner is, Mike, but I'd love to know one day. Um, but anyway, I believe that we need one in our business, but I'm trying to, I'm, I'm asking my head of retail, what is the, and she goes, don't worry, we'll, we'll work that out and say, good, well, as long as you know that something's going to happen there, but there's no demand planner here. We didn't wake up with, with a demand planner in the business because we, we make olives, you know, uh, and, and we try and make them every day, but sometimes we don't, we don't get it, but sometimes we run out of jars, you know, well, there's a demand planner for you. So, you know, it, it's almost like a self-answering question. So yeah, yeah. The, the corporates come in and go, well, okay, so where are, where are the procedures manual? I go, well, uh, have you written one before? So you give it a start writing, mate, you know? So we've invested in operations head, which is good. And that's got its own sort of challenges as well. But yeah, the, the, the hard thing about corporate is you, you, there is no, there is no guy. There is, and the, the future is tomorrow. So I had a really interesting case with my head of retail. He was doing fantastic in retail. What a challenge. I went, uh, and we worked together. I said, okay, how about export? Export's a great little portfolio. So our head of independence is now in charge of exports. And, you know, we were overseas and I was like, this guy's going to be fantastic for, for looking after Malaysia. And I don't have to go to Malaysia anymore. Fantastic. That's great, you know? Uh, and so for me, th- there's, there's the career path that you make. Cause I was pulled up a few weeks ago by saying there's no career path in family business. And to an extent, there isn't, but there is if you make one. Right. So the, yes, there is a career path, but once again, it's a wheelbarrow. Just push it and it'll, it'll be yeah. there, you know? So, um, so it feels like that it's, it's almost a mindset. Yeah. You've got to bring, which is much yeah. more open and, and okay and proactive. From 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 corporate, what I did not learn about corporate is capex. You want to put on ten people, great, give me a capex proposal, you know. And where I've had issues with past staff members, oh, you, you shouldn't do this, you do this. Well, mate, where's your capex? Where's your capex proposal? Because if you want to buy a new machine, oh, well, there you go. What's the payback? Someone wants to sell me solar panels at a cost of hundred thousand dollars. What's my payback? When am I going to save money on my electricity bill? Well, it's a five year payback. Okay, put in writing and get you know and get Ray and I on a good day, you know, when we're not stressed out and. And we'll have a we'll have a bite to eat and you know a hamburger and go yeah okay whatever when do you want to start you know and it's yeah. that easy it's that easy Mike you know you can get agreement within 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 minutes you know if it's good enough but if it's something which we we're a bit foreign with we go okay we might want to discuss it with our FBA colleagues or our accountant or some or our de facto board you know um, but yeah that's that's the way it works you know Love so it. yeah so if again in the same advice mentality memo mm. what what would be the top piece of advice you would give you know, a future leader listening to the podcast. Now they may be thinking, oh, I may or may not do a family business, but um but I'm really enjoying listening to Mimo. Right. What advice find, would you give them? Find something you love doing. I love speaking with people. I love relationship building. Um, I, I think you've got to find something you really love and, and get 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 beyond the money. The money side will come. I've had uh, people that very successful people in business saying the worst mistake I made was one. I had two jobs. One was huge money, uh, but no passion. The other one was you know, less money but full of passion. Would have been a great job, and I took the took the money one, and it was the worst decision of my life. So money is is a, a Okay, it's necessary. I'm not saying you got to work for peanuts, but I think sometimes you you and I've actually seen people that have actually um, not not go to jobs because they are a certain salary requirement and they've lost their way. Um, because I won't work for less than X and they, and they're in their fifties. And I'm sort of going, well, mate, unless you start getting back on the train, the train will keep on going. It's going to keep on going. Uh, and it might be, you're going to have to, and I've seen really successful people drop. And I think a few on your podcast as well have said, I dropped X amount of dollars to go in to re-enter under a lower, lower, but I knew I needed that experience to get to the next level. So yeah, great yeah, advice. It's, yeah. it's something, something that, you know, I mean, <laughs> you're in the business of recruiting. So your job is to see, see what people are worth and, you know, and, and get them paid well, which is, which is normal. But I think like everything else, if people do really well for you, I, I, I often say I've never really lost them on, on pure money discussions, you know. Um, I can usually make something something work, you know. Oh, yeah, money money's a, money should be the hygiene factor. It should Correct. be it should be, you know, you should get paid the right amount for what you're doing, yeah. but be led by the things that drive you. Correct. Think, yeah. And passion's a really, really good one yeah, to it's, to, it's to gotta be passion on. led. You've got to yeah. be led by passion. If you're not yeah. led by passion, um, we, we've got on our boxes passion for food, passion for family. If you right. don't have the passion for food, you probably can't work for Sandhurst, you know. Which takes me to my final question, Memo. Yep. Um, what 
keeps you motivated? Why why are you so passionate after think, all this time? I think because I've uh, we've been blessed to, to have some incredible people working for us that I can just learn from every day. Uh, that can keep me pretty much motivated, uh, and, and and tell me that you know I need to do things differently. That I and I can say to them, listen, give me some help in improving myself. I'm um, you know uh, people that and like I said, people that have been there for twenty years can still teach me every day because they are so dedicated. But they can see through their lens what I can't see. I'm too close to it, um, and and sometimes that's what keeps me going. Is that and that's what it is. Our job and it's our mission is passion, fair passion, family. But we've got to enrich the lives of the people that we work with. We've got to make our staff in a better situation. They've got to be better. They've got to go home and say, God, you know, what did Mimo say today? What did, what, what, what happened at work today? Or, you know, what, 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 what's happening at work? And, and they've got to be really excited about it. Uh, and, you know, I decided to send a staff member two weeks ago. I said, how would you feel about going to Italy next week? And she went, what? I said, you're on a plane next week. Go and go and visit all these factories. And she did. And she came back incredibly, you know, uh, and so, and I'm learning from her because she did the stuff that I couldn't do. So I'm learning from a staff member, which I sent to Italy. And she said, well, this is what we learned. And these are the products that we probably need to look at. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's what keeps me going because I, I love when staff comes back and they're and they're more educated than I am. You know, brilliant. Um, yeah, so that, that's that's a real that's a real motivating factor. So, Thanks. Yeah. Just uh, love the conversation. Thank you. Love man. love the energy. <laughs> It's. Uh, I hope it comes through in the podcast. I certainly feel that I'm. Uh, I'm going to be, you know, bouncing out the room with uh, with that with that infectious energy. Mimo. So that, thanks that, very that, much. That That's is great. great. It's been a real and, pleasure, Mike. Thank you. Good. And thanks to you guys for listening. As always, if Mimo's stories inspired you, you'd like to re-examine your career goals, or reach out to me or any of the team at AXR Recruitment and Search. Remember, our purpose is to help you get the most out of your career. So thanks again, Mimo. Thank you very much, Mike. It's been great. And for me, Mike Dixon, keep listening to our podcast to help your future in sales and marketing. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed today's podcast from AXR Recruitment and Search. We're passionate about helping you get the most out of your sales and marketing career. Keep listening as we bring you more career insights and advice from Australia's top sales and marketing leaders. You just can't get this career advice anywhere else. My name is Mike Dixon. See you next time on Your Future in Sales and Marketing.